Yeah, without further ado, just... No, no, no thank you. Um, so, firstly, can I thank Julian and Adrian for organising this session and for the presentations we've heard so far and for the great discussion. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build upon the discussion where we talked about the units, how we can assign things to different units, how we can test the validity of units. But I, spe I specifically want to go into how a quantitative morphometric frame framework those from the states, the sort of O'Briens, the lice that's moved over, uh, coupled with a research history approach, can shed light on the origins and appropriateness of many of the regional taxonomic units we use. And using our case study from the final Paleolithic in Northern Europe, I want to detail how this combined European and North American framework, the use of the typology with these uh, evolutionary morphometric models, uh, can contribute to our understanding of perceived ethnogeographic variability and meaningful structure through the period. So, in the pursuit of understanding the true nature of structure present throughout the Paleolithic, it's the fundamental precondition that we have unambiguous, defined analytical units. And as we've discussed throughout uh, the last hour, that's not so easy to ascertain. Um, steeped in reach history, the definition of these taxonomic units uh, were of great concern to early practitioners, and it's always been you know, traced back to the origins of typological methods and the identification of key early sites. However, these traditional European-centric approaches to lithic analyses, focusing on types, focusing on sites and specific artifacts, have often created uncertainties and amb ambiguities in the analytical units used. For the old world particularly, these debates have been long-standing, whether this be in the middle and of the Paleolithic of Eurasia, the Epipaleolithic of the Levant, or in the final Paleolithic of Northern Asia. However, in, me in many instances, meaningful structure can be identified, such as the work of Karen Rubens and William Rendry for the European Middle Paleolithic, for example. And so we're left with many problems, which we've discussed already. Firstly, there are issues in capturing meaningful structure within different periods of the Paleolithic, particularly when there are instances in which a myriad of terms are adopted. There's then the issue of how do we objectively determine structure and the relationship between units? At what point does the analysis become logical consistency for structure? On the flip side, how, we, how do we determine what Barton and Neely call these so-called phantom cultures, these cultures which don't actually exist, they're just objective, the non-objective categorizations which we've imposed? Um, perhaps more importantly, once these structures and phantoms have been identified, and what I want to highlight in, my, in, in, in the last part of the discussion is how do we move beyond the recycling of the same arguments? If we know something doesn't work, why do we continue to talk about it not working? Why do we not just get rid of it? And how do we as a collective support the notions made by different researchers and finally move forward in these debates? Perhaps one of the more uncertain periods where, this, where issues of these taxonomic uh, units are apparent is the final prolific in Northern Europe, where a myriad of terms have been used for over a century for these populations. And these have often thought to reflect ethnogeographic variability. You can see on the map um, here, the Crestwallian, the Federmesa, Epimagdalenian, Azalean, many of these we've already discussed. Um, you know, and this work by Schwab just probably best exemplifies this, you know, the abuse of units in his identification of the Rissena, the Wielna, the younger variants in this martial-like chronology. So first we must consider the research historical framework and how these terms came to be. And the consideration of this framework for this period is not new. Hutzmer in 1996 perhaps best highlighted the need for a final Paleolithic which can escape the constraints of contemporary national borders and the paradigmatic, paradigmatic, yeah, <coughs> paradigmatic straitjackets of provincialism and regional chauvinism. One here can include what we've already discussed, these sort of lost in translation events, whether these be terms which we don't know from each other, or in this case, where people have raised these issues on a regional level in which smaller journals but he just hasn't reached the wider audiences, whether for one fault or another. It's you know, not to claim fault, but just doesn't reach the wider audience. Um, and so this is, you know, particularly so for the up and final Paleolithic periods, as you know, Tash has already highlighted, and uh, more of this work can be seen in the sort of uh, Florian and Felix's work, my co-authors, where they highlighted the creation of terms based on counts, raw materials, point types, but they also highlighted um, the sort of the justifications, the national biases, the involvement of political histories and the nation states and the problems that we have today. So, for example, in Denmark, the lack of understanding of what a different point type is may mean that we abuse Bromer points, for example, when amateur archaeologists find different types. 
those which have emphasized the importance of a research historical framework, more than just Felix's work here, have uh, highlighted the necessity of rigorous, high-resolution methods which can test the robustness of the groups and artifact types, identify possible redundancies, and even hint at new taxonomic structures. And I want to stress again that this is not new for the final prolific, and one can consider the work of Boston and Neely and their box plots when they're thinking of these different terms. However, such analyses have always been limited or produced using a low-level analytical framework and not the new suite of morphometric and multivariate technologies, as we've already seen in the previous part of this session. <coughs> and so what, you know, what we're starting to do is to couple the American O'Brien quantitative lithic work with this European perspective. But in creating a quantitative framework for assessing structure and taxonomy, we need to ensure we're not comparing apples and oranges, or apples with crates of apples, and we need to appreciate the level of scale in this. So we need to adopt a, a, a system similar to that of Gamble, and through this we can probably best start to assess different terms against one another. And so, to test the validity of many of these groupings for the final prolific, one way we can examine the basis of such structure is through a two-dimensional geometric morphometric framework, as already uh, highlighted. In the last two decades, these have already highlighted how they can be used to understand different aspects of homonym behavior, uh, and more importantly, the testing of different terms through a high-resolution statistical framework. So in doing such here, we utilize an elliptic Fiori approach, which takes into consideration uh, curves rather than landmarks, as we've previously seen, through our own uh, ATU levels. So we broke up the Federmessa, and we saw that the younger was underneath because the younger came from the Federmessa, so we can start to talk about the different units. Um, and in doing this, this includes a specific level for artifact point type, so cheddar point, Cresswell point, all the seven points. And we're only using those which have been mentioned in text and explicitly referenced. We're not going to use them if someone, someone else has hinted at it. We're just going to use explicit references to explicit sites and explicit artifact types. And as tagged and backed points represent the bulk of classical tree systems for the final pal, the cheddar point for the Tragerian, the Cresswell for the Cresswellian, tagged points, backed points represent the most suitable artifacts to examine these units. So in conducting a GMM analysis, images of backed and tanged points, such as these here, were first catalogued and documented before outlines of each artifact were generated. From here, all outlines were standardized, centered, rotated as applicable, and analyzed in the R environment. <coughs> they were then assessed through a multivariate analytical framework to understand the main changes in the shape. And if we can catalogue the units on the <coughs> shapes, then we can start to understand the robustness of these units. Previously, last year in Maastricht, I presented uh, 1,100 backed points. But following further research, we're here presenting 1,719 complete backed points and 5,574 complete tank points, totaling just under 2,300 artifacts. Further information about this methodology, the script, whatever, just come see me after the session. We can go through it. And so, just to highlight a few examples, here's what we define as the ATU2 limit, the sort of the higher uh, analytical units. And we see some element of structure within the backed points as demonstrable on the left, those that be the backed points that belong to the Hamburgian and the early tank point complex. Uh, we see overlap in the variance of the Laborian, so the Laborian versus the Azulian with Laborian elements and significant homogenization between the Fedder method, the Ansbergian, and the Azillian variants. It's perhaps unsurprising to see a lack of distinction between the Azillian and the Fedder method, given that we use the two terms interjectively. We just, we just use them in what way some people just use both. It's also important to highlight that in developing this system and asserting certain artifacts to units, 809 could not be uh, placed within this level. And this is one of the problems that we're going to have if we're going to define and assess through an ATU system. For tanged point variants, less structure is present with only significant difference noted for the tanged point techno complex. If we look at the ATU3 scale, so we're going below the Fedder method now, so the Yongo, Wielner variants, and all the associated variants, we can see the great, this is where the greatest amount of analytical units for a grouping can be observed. And we can see again this pattern of structure and homogenization. Um, I think the great Lake Clark would hypothesize on the right you'd see what could be termed a clusterfuck of different sides. Um, 
And for this, you know, we can see that on the left, we have the Swedry, the Wittonian, the Eastern European variants as distinct from all other fact point types. We see the Atzenhofer off on its own. The Atzenhofer is probably one of the most interesting ones as it's defined on the distinct use of the non-flint material and is here supported through a GMM approach. It's also important to note areas of homogenization, including the feather mesa variants, which come from the old systems and the old typologies. For tang point variants, the clusterfuck, problems with the current taxonomic system really appear, and varying levels of homogenization can occur. If we just consider the named artifact types quickly, we've got a few minutes left, we can see the lowest possible analytical framework. The similarity and dissimilarity is again noted, with many types of back points, including the Tauka, the Petersfowl, and the Blanchier variants distinguishable from the myriad of terms overlapping the overall group centroids on the left. For tanged points, types including the Alta Nerva and Gremsk forms can be discriminated from the large group of terms towards the center of the graph. However, with many of these examples featuring relatively low counts, it's difficult to robustly examine many of these types. It's very hard to find complete examples in literature where there, are very, very, you know, where there are terms that aren't widely used. And so testing that robustly is difficult. But we can also use the GMO approach to assess the grouping through hierarchical clustering. And we can start to look at the differences between the groups based on the distance between them in different uh, the mean shapes. So you can see, for example, in the middle, um, didn't know how to use this. We can see the Bromer point up here, which, you know, widely classified artifact, matches many of the tanged points which have no classification. And so we have difficulties in starting to assign unambiguous ones to units. More excitingly, if we wanted to avoid the group labels completely, and I'm not saying we should because there are some which are technologically valid or some which are morphologically valid, but what we can start to do is we can take the artifacts on their own we can apply the GM, and we can begin to create new objective units. We can build these theoretical <coughs> groups. And as linear measurements could be developed to categorize this structure, we can retest, use new sites, and we can you know, see the appropriateness of these units on the varying levels. But as Tash highlighted previously, we need to have the spatiotemporal data there for these to be legit. Just because they can be statistically significant doesn't mean they're archaeologically significant. This last bit of work is in progress, and sadly I can't provide any more information here. This is last week's work, or two weeks' work of work. However, using hierarchical clustering and tools from the evolutionary toolkit, we can, be, we can move beyond more subjective categorizations, similar to even Marie Ickinger's in the 1990s, and we can start to test these sort of phantom cultures which have come out from the historical framework and provide an objective basis for understanding technological structure throughout this period. And so, through a combined research historical and geometric morphometric framework, we're able to start to discuss, and the importance is on start, to discuss the nature and validity of different cultural taxonomic units, and begin to discuss the presence of these phantom units. However, in analyzing these different terms, the level on the ATU with which these units are classified is of the utmost importance. And through this ATU system, different rationale for classifying units still do not articulate as well, and there's a degree of subjectivity in what ATU they belong to. The feather mesa, for example, can be a term for a multi-unit structure, sensu suavidism, a unit based on the presence of a feather mesa point, and often used interchangeably with the azillion. And in the ATU system, terms like tanged point technocomplex or the Atzenhofer do not fit or scale appropriately, and it would be difficult to figure out where they go. Um, so while the feather mesa can be scaled down to its constituent parts, where, could we, where should we fit terms like the Criswellian? And this is where we start to really need to redevelop an ATU system to provide that objective framework. Um, which retains scale, but begins to de deconstruct these middling groups. So uh, we've currently revised our ATU system, and work is in progress in looking at the justification for the terms units, not the scale. So if something has been defined by the presence of certain raw material or by a uh, lithic count. Any discussion on nomenclature must also recognize the role with which the product has been made, the importance of the technology, bringing in the, fr the French and the European systems with the American systems. And this work only represents one strand of the research which myself, Felix, and Florian are undertaking. Technological analysis of a series of Danish and German sites are in progress. However, in their totality, these three considerations then, the research historical, technological, and quantitative morphometric perspectives, will not just bridge the Atlantic, so to speak, but also provide the most detailed resolution and basis for deconstructing 
and potentially reconstructing the nomenclature used throughout the final paralytic. Thank you for listening.